Christ's name only. Amen. This afternoon we will open God's Word to Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, and we'll read verses 1 through 11. This afternoon we will hear God's Word uh, proclaimed uh, concerning a true conversion, and for that we will turn to God's Word from which this confession comes, and read Romans 8, the verses 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned, condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So far, the reading of Holy Scripture. <clears throat> this afternoon's message is based on God's Holy Word as we find it summarized and confessed in our Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 33. And you can read that, follow along with me on page 549, 549 in the back of our Book of Praise. So as we turn to Lord's Day 33 this afternoon, we are continuing what was begun last week, the last part of the catechism, the part on thankfulness, which is our gracious response to the saving work of Jesus Christ. We confess in this part of the catechism that a true believer who is redeemed from the power of sin and its consequences who is redeemed from death, entertains or becomes part of a transition. So for example, think of someone who has been in jail for a while, a convicted felon. Think about that time when he is let out of jail and becomes free. Well, sometimes in certain cases when this happens, there needs to be a special home for that person to help integrate back into society. But in other cases, uh, such a person can walk through the prison gates a free person. There's a transition from captivity to freedom. Now, how that person lives in that freedom is very important to consider, and that's what we are going to contemplate this afternoon, if you think of that prisoner, if he would reoffend, that will lead to uh, incarceration again, and the freedoms will be taken away. But if he chooses to live in the new freedom that has been granted to him, that brings a new experience and many new joys. And that's the picture that comes to mind 
when we consider today's Lord's Day, as we talk about going from the captivity of sin and death, having been three, freed through Christ, and going to a life of freedom and obedience. So that's what we think about this afternoon. Let's read together our catechism then, the summary of God's word in Lord's Day 33. What is the true repentance and conversion of man? It is the dying of the old nature and the coming to life of the new. What is the dying of the old nature? It is to grieve with heartfelt sorrow that we have offended God by our sin, and more and more to hate it and flee from it. What is the coming to life of the new nature? It is a heartfelt joy in God through Christ and a love and delight to live according to the will of God in all good works. But what are good works? Only those which are done out of true faith in accordance with the law of God and to his glory and not those based on our own opinion or on precepts of men. So you see how these questions are, are following up on the confession of last week that only those are saved who also show in their new life that they are grateful and repentant. And so that's where those questions come from in this afternoon's Lord's Day. This afternoon we will hear God's word proclaimed then under this theme, when Jesus Christ renews us by his Holy Spirit, the outcome is true conversion. That's the message in summary. When Jesus Christ renews us by his Holy Spirit, the outcome is true conversion. And we'll see then first that there will be heartfelt joy in God through Christ. And then secondly, there will be a love and delight to do the Father's will. So the first thing we consider this afternoon regarding conversion is that there will be a heartfelt joy in Christ. So what is repentance? What is conversion? And we understand these words to be synonyms. Is it something that we see? Is it not a change in behavior and a way of life? Is it not like getting out of jail and walking down the street a free person? Brothers and sisters, if that's what we think about concerning repentance or conversion, then we would be sort of right. Sort of. For the Bible is teaching us that there's more to repentance. There's more to conversion. Because that change, that transition, has to come from somewhere. It has to have a source. And that source has to be the right source. In other words, Repentance or conversion which leads to change of behavior and a new way of life has to be real. It has to be genuine. So it's in, in this light that we can think, for example, about changes of behavior that could be rooted, for example, in legalism. Or, as we noted in our catechism at the end, might be based on the precepts of men, what other people think, other people's opinions. Think Peter, the Apostle Peter in Galatia. And here I'm referring to what is written in his letter, uh, in Paul's letter to the Galatians, and what he says about Peter there. This morning, we heard about Peter receiving real evidence of the Holy Spirit that the Gentiles, so the non-Jewish people, were to be included in the Christian church 
with no conditions except what is conditional for all to be included in the Christian church is a true faith in Jesus Christ. However, Paul writes in Galatians that Peter was becoming influenced by the circumcision party. And so we read there how he stopped eating with the Gentiles. And it was in the eyes of some believers, it was according to the precepts of certain people, in this case, the Jewish Christians, or the particularly the circumcision party in that uh, group of people, that Peter's actions, according to Paul, are not sincere and do not uh, show true repentance, true conversion. Why? Because it was coming from the wrong source. Peter was changing his behavior because of what people thought or what people were saying needed to be done, not what God was saying needed to be done. Another example of behavior that is changed but is not true repentance is where behavior is influenced by consequence. So for example, if we intentionally speed in our cars and then we see a police car and slow down, but then when it is out of sight, speed up again intentionally, there you see a change in behavior, but is it repentance? Is it a, a sign of conversion to Jesus Christ? If such change, slowing down to the speed limit, is rooted in the fear of being caught, or of paying a fine, or paying more money on our insurance, or some other reason, then that's a change that also comes from the wrong source. Maybe a person who gets out of jail is under probation, or a freed prisoner has to wear an ankle bracelet that monitors movement, and that helps the person from reoffending. So that in, in the case of some prisoners, obedience or following the law is only because he doesn't want to get in trouble again. Now, understand me correctly here, to a certain extent, Barriers, boundaries, rules, regulations, laws are necessary to curb our behavior as well as its consequences of misbehavior. And that's good. And that's because we are sinful by nature. Such rules and regulations, barriers and boundaries help us in restraining behavior as, as a whole in a society, and, and therefore protects ourselves and our neighbors. But to simply follow the rules, because we are concerned about the consequences, so that there is merely external change, that is not conversion. The Bible teaches that repentance and conversion, and that's reflected in our catechism this afternoon, is also a change in our insight and in our inclinations. There is a change of heart. You see, conversion is a matter of the heart, not merely outward action. The true repentance that is evidence of faith and salvation is the conversion of the inner self where not only do we begin to do things differently, but we also think differently. 
and we desire differently. New desires are produced within. That is what Jesus Christ came to do for God's people. That was the life he died for. So you see, conversion is two things. Conversion is a change of ways, but more, and even more importantly, it is a change of thinking. It's a change of motivation. It is being rooted in a new changed heart. And Lord's Day 33 teaches us this afternoon that conversion therefore consists of a dying of an old nature and a coming to life of a new nature. It is the change of the whole person. It is, as we read in Romans 8, verse 9, a person who is now controlled by the Spirit. Let me read that again. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So, the Spirit is indwelling. The Spirit is moving within. Or verse 10 and 11, where it talks about how Jesus Christ is also dwelling in us, living in us, abiding in us. Our heart, as it says elsewhere in Scripture, our heart is the home of Christ and His Spirit. And it's important to note, and, and the catechism is very careful in saying it that way, that conversion is something that is described as something that is presently happening, that is presently occurring, that is occurring all the time. There is always the dying of the old nature, and there's always the coming to life of the new nature. It's not true that with the one who is converted, that sin no longer exists in him or her. It's not true that the regenerated person is fulfilling God's will perfectly. Just like for the one who has finished a prison term, the feelings about the old way of life will not necessarily be completely gone. And that's why there has to be restrictions and, and parole rules, etc., to keep the freed prisoner from situations where they are tempted to reoffend. Likewise, in a person who is converted to true faith, so that there is genuine thankfulness, often there is still the struggle to sin. In fact, Satan isn't going to give up so easily. It can even be said that Satan's attacks are actually at that time going to be ramped up Think of a drug dealer who during, and, during prison is converted, who, who is changed from his old ways, and so after prison is determined to, to begin and live a new life, how that drug dealer will be hounded by the old gang to get involved again. Think of what Paul writes in Romans 7. So just prior to our reading passage, where he talks about the struggle of the Christian, the struggle of one who is converted, who wants to do God's law but doesn't, or who, who doesn't want to sin but, but still does. The very thing he wants to do is what he does not do, and the very thing he doesn't want to do is what he does. Paul captures for us in Romans 7 the struggle between the old and the new nature. Between the new nature of one who is believing and converted and the temptations and, 
and the struggles against the old flesh. The point, however, in Romans 7 and also now in Romans 8 in our reading is this difference between one who is not converted and who has become converted. The difference is the old flesh no longer has mastery over the believer. No longer is Satan the master, but Jesus is the master. He is the Lord. And that will lead in the true Christian, the one who is truly converted, that will lead then a sorrow for sin. Not sorry for being caught, not even just sorry for hurting someone or for ruining someone's reputation. Not even sorry for the pain and consequences of sin. While experiencing these motions of feeling bad for those we've hurt and feeling ashamed and, and embarrassed about sins, that's a good thing. That is not the ultimate and first reason for the sorrow of the Christian for sin. The first sorrow, the ultimate sorrow, is towards God. It's because God has been offended. We have offended God by our sin, it says in the Catechism in Answer 89. Think of what is written in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10 where it says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So there's a godly grief, and that is a grief because God is offended for sin. Or consider what David wrote in his song in Psalm 50. One, where he is lamenting following the sin with Bathsheba. And when Nathan, the prophet, it says in the title, went to him and, and confronted him with his sin so that David saw his sin and was thoroughly ashamed. And he talks about his sorrow as well. And then in verse 4, he explains what, where that sorrow is mostly directed towards. He says in verse 4, against you, O God, against you I have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. We anger God by our sin. And when we are sorry, Ultimately for that, sorry for the other elements as well, but sorry above all because we have angered God, that is a sorrow that is rooted in true faith. That is a sorrow that is in the heart, that is heartfelt. And then the flip side. When Jesus Christ is renewing us by the Holy Spirit, we also confess today from God's Word that there will be not only an outward joy, but a heartfelt joy in Christ, a wholehearted joy in Christ, the one who has carried all his sorrows on himself, all our sorrows on himself for our sake. That is a joy that is in Christ, who so exceedingly loved us and showers us with his blessings every day. It's a deep-rooted thankfulness for God's grace for the work and death of Christ. It's a deep gratitude for Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins, even for convicted felons who have had and do serve time in jail, even hard time. Even one of the criminals on the cross who was a murderer. This heartfelt joy, beloved, 
which is the, the, the sign of a converted person. This heartfelt joy is evident in a person's song and praise to God. And most importantly, it's seen by God as the heart is filled with humble and sincere joy. And then it is also evident in a person's change of ways and the sincere desire to do what is right. And that is our second point. There will be a love and delight to do God's will. So beloved, we have noted now in the first place that the true sorrow and joy of, of the converted Christian is heartfelt. It, its source is from the heart where Christ dwells, where the Spirit dwells. And that is what leads then to outward joy, to, to outward obedience. But first let's talk about that sorrow again. With the Christian, the one who has experienced true conversion, where it, wherein the Spirit indwells, where there will be sorrow for sin, then, as we read in our catechism, then there will also be a hatred for sin. An anger and a hatred for sin. A disgust by the offensive nature of sin toward God. For what sin does to God's reputation, first of all, what sin does to the church's reputation, what sin does to our neighbor's reputation, what sin does to our reputation. Sin is an enemy now. And when we sin, we have been cohorting with the enemy. We are like those who helped the Germans in the time of the war, who collaborated with the enemy. That brings up strong emotions of anger and hatred. There's hatred for what sin does to others and ourselves. We no longer justify our sin. We no longer cover it up. We hate it, and we want to be rid of it. And so, beloved, we therefore read that if we sorrow for sin and therefore hate sin because sin is our enemy, then we also are found to be fleeing from sin. This fleeing is the only way to win the war. If we are truly converted, we know that it isn't wise to let sin come close. The Bible says sin is couching or crouching at the door, just waiting to be allowed in. Satan, the Bible says, is prowling around like a lion seeking someone to devour and destroy. Peter actually said that. And Peter would know. Brothers and sisters, in true conversion, we will not let sin or the devil have a foothold. Whoever believes he can remain close to sin or who can be in places where sin is, where sin is powerful, whoever will dabble on the internet and visit places where sin is close, thinking he or she knows how far they can go, don't know themselves. They don't know what Paul did know. Yeah. Not just Peter, but also Paul. Paul who struggled daily with sin. Do we think that we are stronger or more spiritually stronger than Paul? The truth is, beloved, if we don't flee from sin, 
It's like we are moths circling around the flames. Our catechism says, in true conversion, we hate sin and we flee from sin more and more. That desire to flee grows with the effect that sin is farther from us so that more and more we experience distance and deliverance from that sin. More and more we understand that sin dishonors God and hurts our neighbor, so then more and more as we flee that sin, we honor God and help our neighbor. Yes, the flip side is that as we sorrow for and hate and then flee from sin, is that we more and more love and delight to do the will of God. Then we're no longer doing right because we have to. We're no longer doing the right thing. We're no longer obeying God and fulfilling his law because it will somehow benefit us or that we'll get something out of it but because our hearts are changing for God, because the Spirit and Christ are indwelling our hearts, and we are becoming more and more alive in Him. Because our hearts are changing for God. So that in as much as we hate sin and are disgusted by it, as much we are also desiring to do the will of God and we're delighted to do the right things. Indeed, sometimes a criminal is truly reformed. Sometimes a person who has been caught in the slavery of sin is truly delivered from it so that he walks free and there's a sincere desire to do the right things. There is reason for great rejoicing such Faith-based desire and longing translates into good works. Indeed, a wrong condition for doing good works, which actually reveals the old nature, is doing good that's based on our own opinion or on the precepts of men, where we fear a person's opinion of us, where we want a good reputation or standing among our peers, where we don't want to get into trouble, where we want the praise or we, wo- we insist often or always want to be in the right. We considered that already. But the good works that are truly good, that are based on the right conditions, the ones that are rooted in true conversion, they are identifiable by three conditions that are met. First, As we saw in Romans 8, verse 8, the source of our good works, the source of obeying God, is a true faith. Romans 8, verse 8, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but those who are in the spirit do. So, true faith is the source of good works, first of all. Secondly, they are in accordance with God's revealed law, which has been confirmed by the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master, and thus those good works, that obedience, is motivated out of a true love for God and for the neighbor. And thirdly, their purpose is ultimately for the glory of God. We do good to please Him. And that fills us with joy. So we also see then that not only are, does true conversion uh, reveal a heartfelt joy in Christ, but also it reveals a love and delight to do God's will. So in conclusion... We can say this afternoon that in true conversion and repentance, there is a transition indeed where we go from the place of the captivity of sin, the 
incarceration and bondage of sin and evil, we, we go from there to a place of freedom, of liberty. We go from sorrow to joy. We go from a time where we delighted in sin to a time through faith where we delight in righteousness. We go from a time where we hated to do the right things to a time when through faith we, we hate it when we do wrong. So that at times we find that the very thing we do is what we hate and the very thing we love is what we don't do. But by the grace of God, that will not be the norm. That will be the exception. The norm will be that the very thing we do is what we love. And we don't do the things we hate. Amen. Let's join together in singing hymn 55. Uh, who trusts in God, a strong abode in heaven and earth possesses, who looks in love to Christ above, no fear his heart oppresses. Hymn 55.